Welcome to worship for Sunday, September the 13th. You know, this would normally be our kickoff Sunday, and so it's a little unusual for us this year. We're not having a kickoff event as we would normally do, uh, but uh, we're here for worship uh, together uh, virtually online, and so I welcome you to this time of praising the Lord together. Our scripture that is uh, to invite us into a place of worship today comes from Psalm 72, verses 18 and, and 19. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just pray that we would have that sense today. Of course, you are the only one who performs miracles. You're the only one who does what is good and right and perfect. Uh, you're the only true good God. And we pray that this time together, even though it's uh, through the technology of video, we just pray it would be a time that um, you hear our praise and our worship. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, I want to lead us in a prayer time today. And uh, just at the beginning here, uh, admittedly here, it's going to be a a little bit informational for you. I I want to pray for our kids, for sure. We want to be doing that, of course, every week, especially this week, as uh, many have returned to school. But I just wanted to remind you of a piece of news that I shared a couple of weeks ago that we're very pleased that Rebecca Dick is now our children's coordinator. She will be working on almost a quarter time basis helping with our Cornerstone kids. And as you can probably appreciate, it's not just continuing a program, but it's going to be reigniting a program and trying to figure out how we uh, move forward with Cornerstone Kids uh, in this COVID-19 context. So pray for Rebecca. Would you also pray for Louise? And if you haven't had an opportunity to say to Louise Schmidt, thank you very much for her service. Uh, She wrapped up her time as our admin assistant at the end of August. Uh, So I want to have us remember kids. The other thing I wanted to have us remember is next steps, or we've been calling it the road ahead as a congregation. And what that means for us is that we are going to continue to meet in person. That's the main thing that is, is part of this road ahead document that you can read on the website. It's got all the details there. Um, But one thing that I've updated this week is we just heard this week, Wednesday, uh, we heard from the school district that they are restarting school rentals. So we are working on getting uh, confirmation of renting uh, Webster's Corners Elementary School, uh, hopefully for the first Sunday in October. So stay tuned. Uh, It's a developing story and it's quite exciting. So we're going to pray for kids. I'm going to pray for the road ahead. And I also wanted to share a very important matter on the national scene, and that is our um, partners at Evangelical Fellowship of Canada have alerted us to uh, pending uh, federal legislation concerning the um, medical assisted dying. And um, the concern is that this is going to move uh, ahead through the parliament perhaps quite quickly when parliament resumes. And it has some provisions that are of of concern. And so I invite you, uh, if you haven't already looked on the Cornerstone Connector for this week, I have the information for you there and a link where you can uh, get up to speed on this important issue and then have the knowledge to um, approach our MP with with our concerns as believers who are um, passionate about uh, safeguarding life. And so we're going to pray for kids, we're going to pray for the road ahead, I'm going to pray for issues concerning life. And as we pray today, uh, I'm going to also give thanks for God's provision. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. We so appreciate it. Let's, Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our kids, and we pray for Rebecca as she begins her role as our uh, children's coordinator at Cornerstone. We ask that you'd give her um, joy and creativity, and we just pray uh, for this season in which we're trying to think how to uh, continue with uh, Cornerstone Kids programming, but obviously we have the COVID context to to sort through. Uh, Give wisdom and guidance and direction and all of that, we pray. Lord, we also want to thank you for the road ahead because even last week at the park or online, as I shared, we know what you've set before us for September, but now even just this week, you answered prayer about uh, the opening up of rentals. And so we're just asking you, Lord, would you would you continue to um, uh, just rem- remind us and, and, and uh, make us aware of how faithfully you can lead us step by step? Uh, forgive us, uh, forgive me when I've raced ahead and tried to make contingency plans. Help us to trust you just step by step into the will uh, that you have for us. And Lord, we also want to pray about um, the uh, sanctity of life in our nation. We know that euthanasia um, movement has pushed uh, strongly forward. And uh, now in um, some current and, and pending legislation, we are praying that the right decision will be made so that lives will not be more at risk but that uh, the the sanctity of life will be more safeguarded uh, within our country, Lord. Uh, We also, again, thank you so much for your provision 
all the wonderful ways you take care of us. Bless uh, the offerings that are given at the in-person service uh, through uh, electronic means today. We pray that all of what is offered will be of praise and glory to your name. For we ask in your name. Amen. You know, I just want to leave you with a short little verse as we've prayed for God's direction going forward. I was really touched with just this little phrase in Psalm 147 in verse 2. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. Now, maybe because we've been going through the study on Nehemiah and I've been thinking about the restoring work that was done at that time under Nehemiah's leadership in, in the city of Jerusalem, but uh, I was also wondering how are we as a congregation going to regather this fall and how are all the pieces going to be put together? Uh, thankfully, um, I, I'm not the one that has the resources uh, to, to accomplish all of that. God reminded me through this uh, short little scripture, it's his job, it's his work. He's the one that regathered his people. He can regather us. And I've already shared just one little answer to prayer and we're going to expect God to continue to do great things so that we can be in a place of uh, living and sharing the life of Jesus in our community.
Well, I hope you have your uh, copy of the scriptures available, whether that's in digital or print format. Uh, I'm really enjoying having um, all these scriptures on my phone wherever I go. Uh, so that might be a good format for you. But I would invite you into the book of Philippians today. Book of Philippians, and we'll be looking at a very short little passage in chapter 3. You know, there's very deep feeling in Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. I wonder if I'll do it justice here as I read it for you. And as you reflect on uh, the crossroads of life as they're identified here in his poem. Is this familiar? Listen. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, there's a lot that we can say about this poem, a very famous poem by the American author, American poet, Robert Frost. But I wonder, do you think sometimes about the road you didn't take? You know, or do you wonder about the road ahead? In our passage today, we're going to have some instructions about both of those points of reflection. We're, we're going to be cautioned about looking back, and we're going to be challenged about looking forward. It, you know, I think we need to keep reminding ourselves it really is God's passion to lead us forward. He's not in the business of just making us cozy and comfy. Churches that are cozy are, are dying. They're, they're, they're needing reviving. And God has determined a direction uh, for us both as individual believers and then as an entire congregation. He wants to do a work of changing us, of transforming us. He wants to lead us forward on the road of spiritual growth and victory. Uh, God is not just wanting us uh, to, um, to grow and and uh, to do so in a way that we get more and more information or more and more familiarity, but he wants us to grow into maturity that we will be uh, reproducing disciples, growing as disciples ourselves, and then multiplying disciples, building uh, the kingdom of God. So it probably is no surprise to you if I were to say, you know, this was uh, the p same passion that the Apostle Paul had. We only need to look at his letters today. We're looking at one of them, the one sent to Philippi. And, uh, you know, Paul was passionate to see uh, his readers grow in their faith, uh, to be transformed. Uh, so many of the letters that we have that form the epistles of the New Testament were very uh, targeted instructions to struggling Christians in a difficult context. And so we've got such a wonderful help to us today in his letter to the uh, Philippian Christians. Paul challenged them from his own uh, road less traveled, you know, and, and Paul's uh, desire was to be fully and completely identified with the righteous and resurrected life of Jesus. We're going to look at our main passage is verses 12 to 14 of uh, Philippians chapter 3. But just prior, he testifies that he wants to, to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So he wants 
the righteousness of Christ in his life. He, he knew what it was uh, of all people. Paul, in his previous life, knew what it was to be not just self-righteous, but smugly self-righteous. In, in fact, quite literally, he was violently self-righteous. So he wants now Christ's righteousness to be uh, predominant, to be the, at the core of his life. He also wants the resurrection power of Jesus to be uh, front and center in his life. He goes on, verse 10, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, and uh, so as to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul's desire was that Christ's righteousness and resurrection would would characterize his life. And with that in mind, he then comes uh, to just a very honest testimony, kind of a, uh, you know, look guys, I haven't got it all together kind of uh, testimony. We find that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 uh, through 14. Paul's confession was that I I'm not there yet. I'm on the way, no question. He was well on his way of a spiritual maturity as he was teaching and instructing. Uh, but he knew, uh, he had a very clear spiritual self-awareness and he knew that he also was in process. And so let me read his confession in these three verses. Not that I have already obtained all this. So the, you know, the righteousness of Christ and the resurrection power of Christ completely uh, front and center in his life. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So I'd like to share with you two things that Paul says here. I already uh, kind of gave you a hint earlier on that one will speak to the, the looking back and one will address the matter of looking forward. First, let's talk about the fine art of letting go. You know, we all must learn to let go. As I drive around our city, sometimes I see evidences, uh, evidence that people have decided it's time to let go. They might put something out on the lawn and it might say free, or they might have a sign that says garage sale, which means please help take all my junk away. Um, but there's evidence that, you know, this is a struggle sometimes to, to let go because then there's people like me that sees uh, something on the side of the road and I grab it and take it home. Um, and now I have to learn to let go. Well, presently we're in the process of letting go of the summer, you know. Uh, Labor Day, we were up on Burnaby Mountain at sunset. Wow, it was so beautiful. And as, as I looked out, uh, over the view, I was, it was just stunning. And then I looked at the hillside and there were just so many people taking it in. And I commented uh, to those with me, I, I said, it almost seems like a, a, um, a ceremonial observance of the, of the setting of summer, you know? So we, we're, we're, we're all aware of what it means to let go of things. And as Paul speaks profoundly, really, of letting go here, he uses some uh, unique language that really testified to the fact he was aware. God, God's not finished with me yet. God's still working on me. So what is this language? Well, in verse 12, we have this phrase, not that I've already obtained all of this, or the word li literally is, not that I've received it yet. It's not, you know, the, the UPS driver hasn't arrived at my door. It's not fully, you know, the package isn't here. I haven't received it yet. It's not complete. Now, that doesn't mean that he wasn't growing in God's grace and growing in Christian maturity, but he hadn't been completed in that in that process he, he says in verse 12 also i haven't arrived at my goal and he uses the phrase you know i haven't been perfected it's not finished yet uh, in verse 13 he uses this language i do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it to have grabbed on fully and finally 
And so another uh, and more pointed way of speaking about this fine art of letting go, he says quite um, plainly, I forget what is behind. I'm forgetting that. And it's something that's an ongoing process. Not that I um, did it once, but I'm continually putting aside the past. Now, as Robert Frost has conveyed in his poem, we're shaped by our past histories. Our personal stories really um, have, have many ups and downs and, and difficulties and joys, and it shapes us. It really does. And um, sometimes people have asked me, you know, in your life, what, what has really shaped you? And I say, well, quite a few donuts have shaped me. Um, but but in, a, in a serious sense, all of our journey shapes us. And we can look back and, and we can maybe look back with, um, with a fondness, you know, for the good that has shaped us. Or we can look back with um, uh, a bitterness for the negative things in our journey. But we all then wonder, you know, what might have been? We're, we're kind of like the character in Robert Frost's poem. Oh, I, w I wish I could, could see what the other road would have been like. And there is maybe nostalgia, but maybe regret and maybe a sense of longing about what might have been. Now, uh, if you look at Paul's testimony earlier on in chapter 3, he identifies, uh, that's in verses um, 3 through 8, he identifies quite a few things in his resume. Uh, racial purity, um, ritualistically and religiously, he was educated, um, he was, um, um, had performed well as, as a Jew should in, in that context. He had been eager to um, put forward the Jewish agenda, which meant um, capturing and persecuting Christians. So Paul could say, you know, I've got a, a quite a resume, but I, I count that as loss. I consider that as rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. So he doesn't just talk in general terms about I forget what's behind. He's, he's been very specific earlier in the chapter saying, here are specific things. Even though I could claim, you know, my education or my performance, I, I'm not going to because that is not sufficient to move me forward. We cannot rely on even the good of our pasts. Tim Keller has deftly observed an idol is a good thing made into an ultimate thing. And I think Paul would probably say that there were some things about his training, his rabbinical and uh, pharisaical training, you know, perhaps were good things. He certainly had a knowledge of the Old Testament scripture, but he, he also recognized that could be made into an idol. So letting go, in a sense, is a fine art. Why is that? Because there are many good things that we should appreciate and treasure from our heritage. A great example, do you have a godly parent? Maybe a godly grandparent? Someone who modeled Christ for you? Well, we should appreciate that from our past. Um, maybe there's a, a, a teacher, a camp counselor, someone, a mentor who influenced you to grow in Christ. That happened in the past. They helped you make decisions. You know, I, I made some some very significant decisions um, of a surrender to God, both in a Christian high school and also in our Bible school. You know, I, I, I can treasure those things. I can value those things. But in comparison with knowing Christ moving forward, we need to let go of those things and have, because it's a fine art to appreciate and to value, but to let them go in the sense that we cannot build our Christian growth and maturity upon uh, the past, whether uh, it's something we know from a biblical past, historical past, or even our, our personal past. Yes, those things instruct us. They inspire us. Um, but we need to depend upon Jesus for today. We must embrace the fact that we are in the process of growth. You know, 
Paul, Paul jumped on that fact very, very firmly in verse 6 of the very first chapter. He said, I'm confident of this, that God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Right at the beginning of the letter, he's saying, you know, this, this is an absolute uh, basis of our Christian journey. We are in a process. And if we are not careful, if we don't uh, delicately understand this fine art of letting go will 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 lean upon those past things so much uh, that we uh, maybe claim we don't need to be in process and that's a very dangerous place to be uh, with Paul we should we should say I'm, I'm forgetting those things that are behind not in disregarding the blessing but in not building our current spiritual growth upon those things and then in addition to the fine art of letting go, there's the fine line of reaching forward. Uh, according to mathematicians, there's a fine line between a numerator and a denominator. Now, uh, you'll have to just know that uh, the math jokes are about as, as good as it gets with me because mathematics was not a strong subject for me. But I do know there is a line that goes uh, to separate the numerator and the denominator in a fraction. And I also know that there's a fine line involved in this spiritual process of moving or reaching forward. Progressing in spiritual maturity stands in stark contrast uh, to, you know, leaning upon the past and not letting go of those things we cling to and recognizing we're in process. God wants us to stretch us forward. Uh, consider the language of reaching forward. Uh, verse 12, I press on. Literally, I follow, but it's following a goal. Uh, he speaks in verse uh, 13, 14 again of pressing on and he, he identifies it's towards a goal. According to a special mark, that's how I follow. Uh, and then in verse 13, uh, perhaps what really gives the image is the straining forward, stretching forward. And uh, the uh, image is like a runner. And I, I can recall uh, watching our son's soccer team. He had a teammate who was a tremendous soccer player. But I, I, I'm quite certain that if he didn't keep moving his legs, he would fall flat on his face because he was straining and stretching forward. He was leaning so far forward as he ran. And he was a very effective player because his legs kept him moving and away he went with the ball. Uh, we need to have this idea in, clearly in our mind that God is inviting us to, to reach forward, not just to sit and, and rest. There is both an intensity and an intentionality to this. Uh, we need to be uh, diligent and we need to make a decision to participate in what God is doing. And here is the fine line. He invites our participation. He, he waits on us to have a desire and, and a choice, uh, but he fills us with the power to do what he has called us to do. Now, you may have read uh, a number of years ago, a little book called The Prayer of Jabez, in which Bruce Wilkinson kind of brought to everybody's attention a tiny little prayer found in First Chronicles chapter 4. It's very interesting because this little prayer comes right in the midst of the chronicling of all of the tribes and clans of Israel. And in chapter 4, speaking of the clans of Judah, we get to verse 19, and it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And then Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Now, in writing about this little prayer, uh, Wilkinson makes a, a very interesting, very helpful comment uh, that sometimes we have a math problem. I already confess that math is not my strong suit. Um, he, you know, Wilkinson describes human math versus divine math. Let me tell you what he says. 
Human math is the kind of equation in which we say, my abilities plus my experience and training plus my personality and appearance plus my past plus the expectations of others equals my assigned territory. You know, and this territory we're talking about could be our sphere of service, or we could say, you know, how we are reaching forward to serve God. Well, that's human math. And that looks rather dis- depressing if we really think about what we see there. It is not uh, bringing God's power to bear in the equation at all. Look at divine math. Divine math proposes this equation, my willingness and my weakness plus God's will and supernatural power equals my expanding territory or my actually reaching forward to those things that God is calling me to do. Now, notice very carefully, Paul was aware of this. He he was aware uh, that we could rely upon our own resources. He already said, I'm not going to do that in the first part of chapter 3. And then in verse 12, he includes a very interesting little phrase. He says, I'm going to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. God is calling me to reach forward, but he has taken hold of me to do that process. And so there is a fine line in this process of reaching forward, whereby we need to choose to be involved, to desire God's work in our lives, but then not think that we can work it up all on our own. It is God who will work this through us. Now, what is this objective or this goal? To to what end are we straining toward, empowered by God? Verse 14 tells us that we're to strain forward to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, this uh, fra- this passage is very important to me because, in fact, uh, the day I graduated uh, from high school, from a Christian high school, uh, I had the privilege of sharing a little message at the graduation, and this was our theme, run for the prize. So what's the prize? Well, the prize is uh, literally an above calling or this heavenward calling in Christ. And we see that in verse 14. Now, is that, you know, our current experience with Jesus or is that future? You know, perhaps Paul was picturing a Greek runner who had been victorious in the race. And then he was called up from the stadium floor up to the judges, an elevated judges platform where he'd receive his prize. And, you know, perhaps that imagery suggests that Paul is thinking about the heaven word or the prize in heaven, uh, our eternal destiny with the Lord Jesus in heaven. And that's certainly one way uh, we could read this passage. Others draw a parallel with phrases such as we read in Hebrews 3 verse 1 uh, that speaks there of our heavenly calling, the work that we are to do for God, the, the salvation we receive and the service we offer. And I'm not sure if we need to maybe uh, be hard and fast that it's one or the other. I think there's always a present call upon our lives as we journey through this life. And of course, there is a future prize uh, in eternity. Either way, the key is that God is the one who's eager, most eager to produce uh, maturity and growth within our lives. So there is the fine art of letting go, of course, valuing the spiritual investment that's been made in our lives or, or, or treasuring something that was spiritually inspirational to us from the past. But we can't build our lives on past experience. We must build our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do, that is the process of straining or reaching forward. We don't do it on our own. God has to empower us or it will be um, a vain exercise. I encourage you to visit Digging Deeper. I'll have some of these notes and some uh, links for you. But I just want to ask you in closing, are you stuck in the past? 
Is there, you know, a sense in your heart? You know, I wish it could be like the good old days or I remember when and um, maybe you're a little bit like uh, the character from Frost's poem. I wonder what could it have been like? What was that road, other road like? I wish I could have gone back there. And, you know, we can get absolutely mired down in the past. Paul says when it comes to building our spiritual journey and growing, we can't rely on past experiences, though they have, have been a blessing in the past. So there is the fine art of letting go, and I hope you will say this week, God, help me to identify maybe areas where I'm clinging on to those rather than looking to the fresh new work that the Holy Spirit needs to do in my life. Um, what is your current progress? Are you quite comfy and cozy or straining forward for the prize? Not just you reaching for a prize, but you reaching for a prize because God has already taken hold of you and he's going to empower you towards that prize. You know, as people called to live the life of Jesus and share the life of Jesus with a needy community, uh, we, we, we need to take this command seriously. We need to forget what is behind and reach forward. God will give us the grace and the um, ability uh, to be successful as we submit to him in this command. Uh, let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we just ask that you would help uh, us to identify maybe areas that we're, we're clinging uh, to the past. Uh, help us to identify areas where maybe by fear, uh, maybe by laziness, uh, maybe by uh, inattention to your voice, we're not following um, diligently and fervently after that prize that you have for us. Help us in this, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you again for being part of this service online today. I want to leave you with a scripture and then just a couple of reminders for this week. Um, I want to just encourage you from these amazing words of testimony that Paul left at the end of his letter to the Philippian church. He said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He also testified later in chapter four, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So with that in mind, is it any wonder he would conclude to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I trust that you've got in your heart the fact that God is going to do this wonderful work of moving us forward. Um, it's it's uh, needing our participation to be sure, but it is his work and we fall completely upon him. And at the end of the day, we want all the glory and the praise to go uh, to him as well. Uh, you know, as we go through the week, uh, just please remember that we're trying to be very diligent to get all of the uh, news and event information of Cornerstone on our website. I, I get it. I, I know it's a chore to go to the website, um, but we're really trying to make that a hub where you can get information. You will also see some things uh, as we try to remind you through our Facebook page. And of course, you can view uh, our videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, the youth are launching on uh, September 22. So mark that date down if you have youth in your house or maybe you're a grandpa or grandma and you've got a youth that you can direct uh, towards David Epp uh, to be involved. Uh, that'll happen September 22. Please remember our special general meeting, September 27th. We are uh, um, going to be affirming two new leadership team members. Their uh, little bio sketch is in the Cornerstone Connector, so you can become acquainted with those who we are putting forward as nominees. And then we're looking at uh, wrapping up uh, our activity at uh, Maplewood's building. So we have some things in storage there and we're going to be needing to prepare um, things to go in storage and things to go into a trailer to uh, get ready for our uh, new services at, um, at Webster's Corner School. So if you're available to assist in some way, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we could uh, really use some help in making those preparations. Uh, I, I just want to ask uh, you uh, to just remember us in prayer. We'll pray for you and let's work together um, as we've shared today. You know, putting what's behind, let's let it go and let's move forward into what good God has planned for us. God bless you today. <laughs>